Hi, time for yet another CLD video. Uh, this one is again about children's writing. And in today's video, we're going to have a look at some of the theories that surround uh, children's writing. Um, let's start off with this tussle between two different approaches towards uh, teaching writing, namely the creative approach as opposed to the rule based approach. So the creative approach is the idea that we should be allowing children to freely experiment, um, that they should be creative with their language, that we shouldn't be overbearing, that we shouldn't be correcting them too strictly, and we should be allowing children to find their way through the writing process through trial and error. And the argument goes that this is the best long-term way of sustaining the enthusiasm of the child, not by micromanaging them, but by allowing their natural creativity to come through. So advocates of this creative approach, they suggest that if you don't focus primarily on accuracy, then what happens is that you make children braver. They're less afraid of making mistakes. They enjoy the whole process of writing and their self-esteem is also going to rise as well. So this is the creative approach to teaching writing. And you can contrast it with the more rule-based approach. And this is the idea that suggests that early on, what you have to do is make the child understand the basic conventions of standard English, the rules of orthography, namely spelling, of grammar, i.e. syntax and morphology, and punctuation, all of those rules. And if you do that at an early enough stage, then what you're doing is you're enabling the child to make much more rapid progress then much more quickly to be able to produce in the end understandable and appropriate texts. OK, so if we look at the Department for Education their website and see what they say that key stage two children should be doing, i.e. eight year olds to 11 year olds, it appears to be pretty much a rule based approach. Um, as it's requiring children to be introduced to some of the following skills. Um, cast your eye down this formidable list. Formation of nouns and adjectives using suffixes. So, you know, children are expected to know the basics of morphology at key stage two. We have subordination and coordination in sentence formation, which essentially means the ability to construct compound and complex sentences so things like relative clauses and then we've got all the rest of these things so expanded noun phrases uh, the ability to grapple with verb tenses uh, to be using the progressive rather than the simple aspect of the verb progressive aspect being the ing continuous form of the verb and then of course being able to use in a controlled accurate way the basics of punctuation, such as capital letters for proper nouns and the beginnings of sentences and significant beginnings of significant words in titles, uh, full stops at the ends of sentences, uh, question marks and exclamation marks. And dare one whisper the word apostrophes as well. So being able to use apostrophes, flying commas, not just for omission, but also to denote uh, possession as well. So that's a pretty formidable list that the uh, Department of Education are putting forward. And you could argue that it's a, it's a quite a rule based kind of structure that children are being pushed through. Um, if you've got your AQA textbook, then what you need to be doing is you need to be looking at pages 126 and 127, which kind of spell out the arguments for creative model versus the rule based model and you need to be kind of summarizing them in your own words and there's a practical activity to do in there as well because once you've done the summary on page 126 and 127 there are a couple of texts text 14n and 14o and what you need to be doing is making notes on these two texts to what extent are they illustrating aspects of either the creative or the rule-based models of language. And there's a really interesting poem, 14.0, that starts off, I am me, double exclamation mark. I ain't done nothing wrong. I ain't done nothing bad. 
And so it goes on like that. So it, uh, what you need to do is kind of annotate the language features that the child has consciously used there and try and relate it to this idea of, is this a product of the creative model or do you think it's a product of the rule-based model? Okay, now we're going to go on to some more of the theorists. We have the famous Lev Vygotsky. He's so famous that the Beatles sang a song about him. All you need is Lev. Yeah, Lev Vygotsky. And he believed that uh, children should be proactive in their learning. So remember, he was writing in the 1920s and the 1930s when the basic rule of education was that children sat silently in separate desks and they wrote down what the children sorry what the teachers told them to do sounds like heaven to me he came along and was pretty revolutionary because he was suggesting that actually in order to learn effectively you need to be an active participant um, so uh, the students or the children need individual support at important moments and what you need is the mko the more knowledgeable other to be scaffolding the children's learning and helping them move to the next stage. So he introduced this concept of the MKO, and he also introduced that concept that we already know about the zone of proximal development, which is that area between what a child can achieve already by themselves and what a child can't achieve, but can only achieve with the help of an adult. So the idea of the scaffolding is that it pushes children through the zone of proximal development so that they become more independent learners. So here's Vygotsky believing that just as speech is acquired in infancy for the purpose of understanding and controlling the environment, so mastery of writing comes from using to satisfy some need or fulfil an intention. So it's all about the purposes and the functions. And he sees it meaningless that children are doing kind of just tasks and exercises which are just independent. He thinks that, you know, children must have a motivation. There must be a real, real life purpose to the writing. There he is. OK, so along comes James Britton, who is a, a British educationalist. Um, and he did a lot of research into children's early writing. And he formed the opinion that no one can learn to write well without first being given the chance to write about what matters to her. For a reader will, not res will respond to not merely the form, but also the sense of what she has to say. OK, so this is James Britton trying to say, look, it's really important that in educational settings, the children are given real tasks with real purposes in order to engage with. Otherwise, it's, it's a hollow kind of exercise. So Britain is kind of building upon Vygotsky's ideas. And he basically suggests that in, in schools, writing fulfills these three main purposes. One, building a relationship with the teacher. And Britain sees that as really important in those early key stages. Uh, secondly, aiding learning by allowing children to organize and extend their knowledge so writing is a tool by which children can develop their learning and then thirdly categorizing and exploring experiences okay so now we move on to britain's model so basically he splits writing early writing by children in primary schools down into three constituent parts um, the first kind of stage that he identified was expressive writing. He says this is really the first type of writing that children tend to develop when they're in crawls, preparatory and consolidation stage. Children are essentially doing expressive writing. It tends to be first person. Uh, it tends to be concerned with the self. And that's because at this stage, the child is basically exploring parts of their own identity, something with which Jean Piaget would concur, because in his sensory motor and pre-operational stage, he's all about the children in being egocentric. Britain then argues that as children write more, then uh, they develop skills in these two other categories. So you have what he's calling 
poetic writing. Now, this doesn't mean just writing poems, although it can include that. It means kind of literary or figurative writing. So the use of writing in stories and poems. And this sort of writing, he argues, encourages children to think about the craft of writing. So certainly in Key Stage 2, children are encouraged to use imagery. They're introduced to concepts like similes. They may even be looking at metaphor in some way. So the use of figurative, non-literal language is what James Britton would call poetic writing. And then finally, we have so-called transactional writing, which is more purposeful writing for the real world, whatever that is. So, for example, writing instructions or producing a report. And the idea of transactional writing is that there is some level of objectivity going on, that the writer is able to detach themselves from the writing and they're able to adopt a kind of impersonal tone. So you would expect that more in Kroll's third stage, uh, the differentiation stage, where children are writing in for different genres and different purposes. OK, so these terms, they're really useful when you've got some data in front of you in the exam or maybe on your language investigation uh, and you're trying to categorise the, the processes of language that's going on. Use these terms. Refer to Britain's model and see if they fit into any of these nice tidy boxes. And maybe they don't, in which case that's, a, that's great because what you're showing is that you are questioning the premise of some of this theory little task for you to do there just pause the video and those seven there which of these writing tasks are do you suppose are expressive transactional or poetic okay so for my money a diary about the summer holidays well it's probably likely to be expressive because it's quite a personal kind of task so i would probably say that's likely to be an expressive piece a poem in the style of a Shakespearean sonnet has got to be a piece of, by definition, poetic writing. A letter to apply for a job, wouldn't that be transactional? A short story in the crime genre, well, in a sense, it's an expression of all of these three, isn't it? Because in a set, it's poetic in the sense that it's probably using figurative language. Uh, but then again, you could argue it's transactional because it's hitting a particular narrative genre. And also, you could also uh, argue that it's expressive too. Okay, so it could be a combination of all three. Certainly a newspaper article about a recent school fundraiser is transactional. A speech to deliver to new entrants to a school would equally be transactional. A description of your favourite place, well, that's more likely to be expressive, but there may well be poetic elements in there. So the best thing to do is to kind of hedge your bets on this and not necessarily nail a text as being one of these, but to argue that it may have elements of more than one. OK, we now move on to Jean Rothery. So Jean Rothery is an Australian, and she looked at the kind of writing that was going on in primary schools in Australia in the 1980s. You see, until the 1970s, it's argued, the teaching of writing tended to focus on technical accuracy. So a lot of it was about kind of rote learning, which means learning by heart and dictation, just writing down things that the teacher was telling you. And so Rothery published this quite influential report about genre based approaches going on in Australian schools. And so this report really considered the effectiveness of teaching writing by looking at purposes and how those purposes can be best fulfilled. So it's trying to move children away from seeing writing as a kind of mechanistic thing. And it's trying again to link it in. This is a bit like the Vygotsky thing that we were arguing before, that the purposes and the motivations behind the writing are absolutely crucial to success. So here is the young writer saying, why am I writing this? So the purpose, who am I writing this for? Who is my implied audience? What form of writing will suit this purpose? What's the genre or the form? And so what style do I need to write it in? So what are some of the stylistic conventions that I need to be applying to make it a convincing piece of text? 
Okay, so Jean Rothery kind of identified some of the earliest forms that children were made to do in the classrooms. And the earliest one that she says is about observation, observation stroke comment. So there's an example of a six-year-old's writing. One day, my mum bought me some books and I felt glad. So here you've got a first sentence which presents an observation. And then in the second sentence, you've got an evaluative comment. Okay, so very simple, very straightforward observation comment. Uh, sometimes it's a longer piece and sometimes the observation and the comment are kind of interspersed. It was a good day at the zoo. I like the zoo. It was good and fun. I had a lot of fun. I like the polar bear and I liked the hippopotamus. They're big and fat. I like the pretty birds and I had a good day. So you've got this interspersing of observational comments and um, kind of evaluative comments at the same time. Okay, a second category that Jean Rothery was talking about was recount. So this is a kind of step up from the first one uh, because usually this is chronologically organised. So it's a chronologically organised sequence of events. Let me put some money in the meter. There we go. Right. <clears throat> um, so it's chronological. Um, so in your more mature examples, you're likely to have stylistic features such as an orientation at the beginning, which will be explaining about the context of the, um, of the event. So more mature ones are going to have an orientation at the start and a reorientation perhaps at the end with m maybe some kind of evaluation of what was enjoyed or not enjoyed about the trip. So if you're looking at the schematic representation, it would go orientation, event, resolution. Um, it's more like a narrative genre than the previous category that we looked at, observation comment, because it's moving forward in time. Um, however, it's, it is different to narrative. I mean, in a recount, events tend to proceed smoothly. Right, we did this, and then we did that, and then we had our lunch, and then the afternoon, blah, blah. Whereas in narrative, usually the writer does interesting things with time, so and also creates some kind of sense of uncertainty, so that we are panting to know what's actually going to happen at the resolution of this story. So that's called jeopardy, when it, 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 it creates a sense of anticipation of what's going to happen next. So recounts don't tend to do that. We then have a third type of uh, category that Jean um, <coughs> Rothery was talking about, and this is report. Uh, this is a factual, objective description of events or objects, very different to a recount. Um, and if you're thinking about the schematic structure, it's usually like this. So some kind of general classification, like a definition of the thing that's being talked about and followed by a description. And so it differs from a recount because there's no chronological sequencing of events. There's an example. The bat is a nocturnal animal. It lives in the dark. There are long-nosed bats and mouse-eared bats, also lettuce-winged bats. So there you are. That's following the general classification in the first sentence. And then you've got the description in, the, in what follows. Um, Finally, narrative. Once there was a dog named Whiskers. He got run over because he ran in front of a car. He was very sick after. He had to be rushed to hospital by ambulance and fast. At the end, he ended up dying. Isn't it sad? William Shakespeare, move over. So, narrative writing. So, this is distinct from a recount because... What you've got is the inclusion of event and which usually constitutes some kind of problem or complication. And so the complication has to be resolved for the better or for the worse. And that's what makes us want to read on. So in narratives, they usually begin with some kind of orientation, which usually tells us where the thing is taking place, when the thing is taking place, and also establishes the characters. So we have temporal or spatial setting, and we have elements of characterization as well. Um, 
orientation is usually followed, as I said, by some kind of complication. And then the complication is usually followed by some kind of resolution. There may well be a coda, which kind of states the point of telling the story in a quite overt way or an implicit way. Um, obviously, as the child gets older, these sorts of narratives may become more complex and your complications and resolutions can occur more than once. Um, so your schematic structure would look something like this. So you've got your orientation at the beginning, you've got your complication, you've got your resolution, and perhaps you've got a coda. Um, it's interesting, isn't it? Because children are exposed to narrative structures from a very, very young age. You know, they're sitting on the parents' knees, for example, and looking at storybooks. So you would have thought it was perhaps the, the one category, the one genre that children will be able to master very quickly. But in their research, Rothery and her colleagues, they found that there were no true narratives in terms of what we talked about there by very young writers, by which I mean kind of five, six, seven-year-olds. And really, they felt that narrative writing is more likely to be taken up with any level of success in the third year of schooling, okay, by sort of seven or eight-year-olds. Okay, so the final thing to do then is to go to your booklet. Um, sorry. Go to your booklet, and in there I've photocopied some pages from a textbook. So go to page 23 and 25, and you'll find uh, three good examples of texts written by youngsters. Uh, one's called Our Trip to Chatsworth Farm, that's on page 23. And then you've got one called My Favourite Place and another called Hedgehogs. So what you want to do is you want to look, read them carefully. Which of row three's categories do you think best applies to these texts? And then you want to kind of deconstruct them in terms of what genre features the child has obviously learned and what have they yet to learn. So draw attention to some of the most significant language features and you would be helped on that by uh, going forward, uh, it's actually wrong on there, going forward to page 50, page 50 and 51, which is giving you a whole set of prompts there of things that you can ask about the language in children's texts. Okay, so we're gonna call it a day on that one and let's see how you get on. <laughs>